Welcome back to the Good Morning Naja Show on Wazobia TV. We promised you some interesting, enlightening, educating interviews, and we bring you one of those in a moment. Uh, joining us via Skype, of course, is Dr. May Ikeora, an author, an ex-beauty queen, and an advisor, or the advisor, Raising Girls Project. Good morning, Dr. May. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Good Thanks morning. for having Good morning. Our pleasure. You are welcome. How are you doing, <laughs> first of all? How has lockdown slash easing of lockdown been treating you? Um, I'm up and down, really, but uh, I got used to staying at home. And I do work from home. Okay, so it was good. Amazing. So it's, awesome. it's, it, it's like it's easy for you. It's not like uh, you're, you're used to the bustle of going out and all that before. So it's just like, yeah, it's like almost life. business as usual day. for you, right? <laughs> no, no, not. Completely, because I also run a business in Nigeria, so it kind oh. of uh, sort of affected my business in a certain way, but oh. also opened up new opportunities as well. Okay, okay, Amazing. good stuff. All right, so uh, let's uh, go into the conversation yes. right away. We're talking about uh, human trafficking, right, and how uh, tackling uh, human trafficking in Nigeria. First of all, people, you know, people don't even some people don't even know when uh, they are in a situation like that. Some people still don't understand what yeah. human trafficking really entails. So uh, let's start from there on a lighter note. Can you just tell us, uh, for the layman watching, what is human trafficking? How, how would you know that it is actually human trafficking? Well, the simplest way to um, explain what human trafficking is, is uh, basically still of human beings for the purpose of exploitation. Hmm. whether it's labor exploitation or sexual exploitation or domestic um, servitude. Hmm. Uh, that's the easiest way to put it. Okay. However, trafficking tends to take place in different countries in different ways. So okay. the way trafficking happens in Nigeria is a little bit different. Yeah. So when you're telling someone you're being sold for the purpose of exploitation, yeah. they might not actually see the dynamics at which they were recruited in the first place. So one has to kind of understand how trafficking takes place place in different places to be able to say this is how you define it in certain countries. So in Nigeria, like it's, it's really a peculiar definition. Mm. Okay, interesting. So now we've defined it, we understand what the discourse is this morning. Uh, what are yeah. the major causes of human trafficking in Nigeria? Because, I mean, you've defined it and a lot of people have experienced these things. Human trafficking didn't start today, didn't start yesterday, but for yeah. some reason it keeps happening. So what are the major causes as it relates to Nigeria? So definitely, poverty is one thing that people that resonate with um, the causes of trafficking everywhere in the world. Really. Um, but in Nigeria, particularly, some people will add food to it. They would add ignorance. You ignorance. know, you would add political instability. You also look mm -hmm. into yeah. conflict, for instance, like what's going on in say, for instance. You would find that there has been a lot of displacement. Uh, women and girls who become vulnerable to being trafficked. You know, demand as well uh, is one of the causes of trafficking. You can be looking at the supply of it because when there's no demand, demand then there's okay. no demand. Mm. Yeah. There are a number of things, unemployment, political instability in our country can drive people to be vulnerable. Basically, anything that makes um, people vulnerable where they are will be susceptible to trafficking. Mm -hmm. mm. And you, you, you were speaking about uh, ignorance and illiteracy. And so how does that uh, contribute to human trafficking? Seeing the fact that we would say a lot of people are, um, are, are privy to have this information on how these things happen. But sometimes we just, we just ignore it. Or it just happens that it's really not, it doesn't look as it seems when you have a relative or someone really close to you telling you, okay, I want to take this person to do this and do that. And you think, okay, yeah, it's cool. So how would you say um, ignorance and uh, uh, illiteracy has, you know, really helped in this or affected this in any way? Basically, I would say it's on different levels. So on one hand, it depends on how the trafficker recruits his victim. So there are certain times in some cases you would find that the, the person is being recruited through their parents. Yeah. So as when it's an uneducated, uh, uneducated family where they are uneducated people, yeah. you know, tell them, oh, I want to take my child abroad, you going to study okay. there and all yeah. of that. You can imagine a, a woman or a man who is ignorant or what to go to school to really even understand what this person is saying. They basically take all the things on face value. 
you know, they, don't, they don't ask the right questions because no parent wants to kill their child. True. You know, they want good things for their children. So someone comes in and says, your child is not educated, let me take this person mm -hmm. to London and get them educated. Mm -hmm. The parents will say, no, I'm going to ask the right questions. So that's one aspect of recruitment. So because the parents are not really educated, they're not are illiterate, they are not able to ask the right questions. And that way, the child is taken away from them, almost like with their own consent yeah. to take that child. There is also a situation with young people today, living in a society where vanity is a uh, goal, really. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody wants to make it. No one is asking questions. Where is this person taking their money from? Everybody and wants to blow. Exactly. <laughs> so, and, you know, this also craze of migrating abroad and all of that. So yeah. someone comes to you as a friend, listen, I can help you get to uh, Europe. And yeah. You can get it easily. And you can imagine sometimes the trafficker comes from abroad and they've, uh, they spend a lot of money. So they create this facade of business and the build some that, level of trust. Exactly. Mm. And that way, that person gets deceived and coerced into taking that trip. Along the line, sometimes it's never the same, especially different depending on how the person is being moved. If you're being moved in, through an illegal means, which means you're going to go through Libya and all of this, yeah. uh, the death and all of that, and they suffer all sorts. Uh, when I was working in a drug case, we came across a number of cases where people were uh, trafficked because they were vulnerable migrants on routes to Europe, mm -hmm. going to the wrong route. So even in, the, in transit, they get exploited. Wow. Yes, so I'm sure you guys are conversing with the, the CNN report mm -hmm. on the African that were captured mm -hmm. in Libya and escaped there and sold actually, literally in front of our faces. Yeah, mm. it's, 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 it's interesting Absolutely. that uh, these situations can still happen in times like this. Looking at how we actually feel we're more enlightened, we're more uh, educated, and uh, still these things are still happening. In, uh, in different ways. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that we're having this conversation. So, um, as it is now, what are the, or some of the international responses uh, as regarding this, seeing the fact that it's, it's here, it's happening, what are the international responses regarding it? So, there, there's been a lot of uh, laws, and those laws have existed for a long time. Yeah. The anti slavery laws, we've had them since the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had laws, different laws, who have who has evolved based on the way trafficking is being understood. Mm -hmm. The most prominent one of them all is the Palermo Protocol, uh, which was um, created in the 2000s. Okay. And from that law, as other countries have sort of adopted and ratified the international law and actually implemented them in their countries. For instance, Nigeria, Tuna, um, enforces their anti-trafficking uh, law in Nigeria, which was also amended in 2015 mm -hmm. to extend the penalties, the punishment uh, um, being allotted to traffickers, and actually finding better ways to uh, support victims. Mm -hmm. Very key in international responses to human trafficking is following the four, which is uh, protection, prosecution, yeah. uh, prevention, and partnership. You know, partnership is really key because this is a trans-border crime, cross-border yes. crime. Yes. Well, you know, Nigeria is even a, a transit, it's a, it's a destination country. It's also a country where you receive the victims as well. It's three things in one. There are mm -hmm. some countries that are transit and some countries are just destination. Europe is usually destination a lot. So you need to work with all the countries along the chain of, micro, uh, of uh, human trafficking you need to resolve it. And this is what the international laws and the national laws try to address. Interesting. Based huh? on this principle. Yeah. Absolutely. Still on solution, ECOWAS in particular, is there any way ECOWAS responds to cases of human trafficking within uh, West African nations? Again, it's all through um, um, regional laws which have been put in place and conversations about this with member states to do uh, what they need to do. I don't feel like uh, echo trafficking the mm -hmm. way that, uh, you would um, you see that you and all these people of it yeah. um, or um, the, the US um, State Department looking to the same thing as well. Um, you don't hear a lot of about, uh, you don't hear a lot about 
when it comes to ECOWAS. But ECOWAS does do something about this. Mm-hmm. I think it can do more. Mm-hmm. There are rather few you know, laws in place and policies mm-hmm. to encourage member states to do the right thing, to adopt the right uh, regional laws, to also look into the regional frameworks so that this, member states are working together to deal with the issues mm-hmm. across the border. Mm-hmm. So you would find that Nigerians are going to Mali, uh, Nigerians are going to Cote d'Ivoire, yeah. those places. Yeah. Yeah. Nigeria is a rich country. Why yeah. are our girls going there? Why are they taking them there? Mm. So these are the things that I think the Ecuador need to do more. I think Ecuador needs to do more. Mm. There are there are issues in place to deal with this, but it should be better. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Um, is there any gender that is more prone? To being human trafficked. So, do we have more cases of girls or boys or male or female people being trafficked? Mm. So, it depends on what it is. When it comes to sexual exploitation, women are like almost 90% victims of sexual exploitation when it comes to trafficking. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to sexual exploitation, you find that the men are more. Uh, yeah. You find that even in, in a dose state, for instance, where I work the government on tackling this issue. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot more men still than female because when it comes to migration, the men are more prone to, be able to migrate and the, the process of migration that they get in place. So there is intention to traffic sometimes might not start from Nigeria, but it might go along the way. And these things are sort of changed in different ways. What I found in Edo State was more that it was a migration driven trafficking more than anything else. Hmm. So it was migration that was uh, happening in more than that. Okay, so uh, you, you had a con- you were speaking about uh, asking the right questions from uh, the parents or whoever is supposed to be uh, like a guardian about uh, on, on, on the children or the persons who are being trafficked. So I would like to ask, as, uh, as, as someone who has been an expert in this for quite some time, what would you say right are the right question. questions to ask as a parent now, if uh, someone approaches a parent, okay, I want to take your child to uh, America or mm-hmm. to the Europe to go and uh, this or to Lagos, <laughs> bring them <laughs> from uh, the one village to Lagos. What are the right questions a parent should ask? Or what is the right procedure the parent should request of whoever comes with this approach? Would they sign documents? Would they, uh, you know, who would like to know that? They should sign documents, you know, there is a fostering system in Nigeria, there is an adoption system in Nigeria, and this is being carried out by the relevant ministries in Nigeria, whether it is the Ministry of Women's Affairs or whatever it is. Yeah. This, somebody needs to be aware that your child is moving. For instance, when it comes to moving abroad, um, when a child is being taken, uh, the, there are questions that are asked by the immigration who is this child? Who is the parents of this child? Yeah. Who some mothers can travel with their child without the comfort of the father? How much more somebody who is not Whose even the child is not his? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Hmm. So uh, there, those are two, two questions. There are documents of, of consent that need to be there, and that, that awareness that somebody, there's some sort of authority that knows that you're taking this child. Mm-hmm. Are you? Are, is, are you adopting this child? Are you? What is it? What are you trying What's to do? Your intentions. Yeah. <laughs> Your mm-hmm. Let me see the, the a letter of admission. Let me mm-hmm. see the passport. Because mm-hmm. sometimes the parents are not even aware that in the passport of a child, this is the name of the trafficker that is there. Yeah. The there are a number of things. But documents can be forged and yeah. all of that. Yeah. But the organization, so if someone says they want to do this with you, okay, contact NAPTIC. If you're not sure, just contact NAPTIC. Mm-hmm. They're everywhere, they're in Benin, they're, they're in the East, they're in the Southwest, they're in Abuja. So contact them and those, those people know what to look for. Nothing knows what to look for. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, so just in case they, don't, they can't ask all the questions because, you know, this is the third most lucrative crime in the world. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the factors are very sophisticated and they are very well connected. So they might even well bring you a very authentic document. But we rest assured that a native um, authority will be able to tell you and confirm to you, and at least you can hold them responsible. Yeah. They, they get the advice that you, you get. Hmm. 
Oh, interesting, because the reason why I asked that, because uh, like you said, sometimes the, the, the person comes in as a relative, sometimes they are close f family friends, so you can't really say, oh yeah, where's the document? Mm -hmm. Show me the letter. Are you sure you're going to do this and do that? But like you yeah. said, they should they have uh, the organizations they can reach out to to be sure that uh, their child is safe. It's, 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 it's a good conversation, good time we're having this conversation. Absolutely. All right, so um, looking at, at the laws in Nigeria now, speaking from home now, do you think, uh, what are the laws put in place in Nigeria that, you know, can uh, cover this aspect of uh, human trafficking? Do you have any, do we have laws in Nigeria that cover this? Yeah, definitely. Like I, like I said to you, one of the major laws in Nigeria is the Nazi Act 2015. You know, the NATIP is the uh, agency that looks into enacting this, uh, our trafficking persons law in okay. Nigeria. Yes. You know, so that's it's encompassing. So, don't get me wrong, laws can be adjusted and amended, and trafficking, um, our anti trafficking laws in Nigeria have been amended three times already, mm -hmm. or twice, I would say. And the last time was in 2015. So, it has everything in place. And we have a child um, a labor act, a lot of things. That, that also touches on trafficking. But the most comprehensive is this first one I have just mentioned. Yeah. However, the biggest issue when it comes to law is enforcement. You know, NAPIP has been doing a very good job when it comes to doing something about trafficking, mm -hmm. given that we didn't have anything like that in the 19, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we have one in the 2000s and and the, the agency um, can only do better, you know, but when, of course, they suffer resources. They don't have enough resources to deal with the issues. We don't even have a welfare system mm -hmm. that, say for instance, the UK has, where you can have, you can look into intersectoral um, collaboration yeah. in addressing the issues. You know, so that's also an issue for NAPTE. You know, NAPTE can do as much as they can do there, but they are not an, an encompassing agent, mm -hmm. agency mm -hmm. that can deal with the whole Nigeria and it's just yeah. one agency. So yeah. All um, ministries in Nigeria have to take part. Different NGOs need to come together. We need to value our NGOs in yeah. because they yeah. do great work as well and support them. All right. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much uh, for this conversation, this uh, Dr. May. Uh, we're hoping that we'll get to do this again because this is a conversation that still needs to be uh, um, said over and over again so that it can get to the minds of uh, the people. But it's been great talking to you, and we're hoping to do this sometime next Absolutely. time. Dr. May, thank you for joining us. Thank you us. so much, Dr. May, for joining us. Have a lovely day. And you, you too. too. <laughs>